2022. My name is Robert Manford, and I'm the Deputy Director for Planning. Just wanted to introduce uh, the planning staff that are present over here, and then we could start. Uh, go through them, Sylvia, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, happy Friday, everyone. I'm Sylvia Doe, uh, Planning Division Manager with Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Good, then uh, John Tu. John Tu, Acting Division Manager, overseeing the Development Review Team. David Keon. Oh, David Keon, I'm Principal Planner on the City's Environmental Review Team. Good, and then, um, Last but not the least of the planning staff, oh, actually, Michael, sorry, Michael, <laughs> I see you as well. Oh, hey, Michael Brio, Deputy Director of Citywide Planning. Welcome, everyone. Good. And then, um, although we do have other staff here, they will speak and introduce themselves. They will introduce themselves before they speak. But the last but not the least of planning staff is Chris Burton, who is our director. And just so you know, this is something that we do every year. The past couple of years, uh, we've done it remotely just because of the COVID, but it used to be more fun. We would go to sites that you, the commissioners, have actually uh, acted on that have been built. But unfortunately, because of the COVID, we've had to do this uh, remotely. So, uh, Chris. Thanks, Robert. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to see everyone. Um, for, I think I know everybody, but for those who don't, my name is Chris Burton. I'm the Director of Planning, Building, Code Enforcement, um, which uh, is a lot right now. There's a lot going on. Um, so definitely wanted to take uh, a minute and take the opportunity to just come say hi um, and do a quick intro. Um, you know, really excited for the content this afternoon. I think there's a lot we're going to cover. And I think it's just sort of this really important moment in the work that we do as staff, but then we do collectively with the Planning Commission. Um, and, and important for a couple of different reasons. And I think it's some of this is sort of highlighted in the agenda. Um, the world in which we live in continues to change rapidly. Um, both from a, a sort of um, an environmental standpoint, you know, sort of the environment in which we exist, um, the sort of the nature of the city, the nature of our population continues to shift. Uh, but then also the regulatory environment around us continues to shift. So as we look at changes to state legislation, as we look at changes to council policy, um, that there's a lot of things moving. So, you know, today we're going to talk about some of that. We're going to talk about changes to uh, the way we uh, analyze uh, transportation with VMT and sort of the updates to that policy, um, changes that are going on around some of our housing policies for affordable housing. So, so a lot there. So really appreciate you all taking the time to dig in with us. Um, I know there's a, a lot to, to learn and a lot to take in, um, but certainly the staff really know their stuff um, and, and will guide you through it. I think the other thing I just wanted to highlight before I disappear, um, and the other reason I think just is a really important time, is obviously we have a transition occurring at City Council. And so the role of the Planning Commission just continues to be so important um, as you provide those recommendations to the City Council as we've got you know new council members that are coming in. Um, your experience and uh, understanding of kind of planning projects is going to be a critical part of, of that learning curve for them. So, like I said, appreciate the time. Uh, great to see you all. And I'll hand it back to Robert. Thank you, Chris, for your words. Um, we'll move on with the agenda. And the next uh, item will be uh, uh, Rachel Vanderveen, who is from our housing department, to talk to us about affordable housing uh, basics and San Jose's IHO requirements. Rachel, good afternoon. And happy to see you. Hello. Good afternoon, commissioners. Rachel Vanderveen, uh, deputy director of the housing department. And I'm um, very happy to see all of you today and just spend a little bit of time um, talking to you a little bit about what the housing department is and some of our major programs and policies. Um, I think that, you know, for those of you who've been on the commission for a little while or, you know, even not that long, um, many times we end up kind of digging all the way in on some of these issues. So. I think it's a great opportunity to proactively kind of go over some of the basics and just the language we use and all of that, just so that um, 
when these issues do come up, we're all kind of prepared and have a little background in how to make decisions. So, um, so let's see that. I will go ahead. I have some slides, so I will, let's see. Oh, do I have the ability to share my screen? Oh, yeah. Jennifer, can you please give me access? I think I can, hold on, sorry, it was me. Okay, and I will put this, ooh, I'm like, which one do you see? <laughs> hold on. I'll just do it like this. Can you guys see that okay? Yep. Okay. All right, so um, so what I'm gonna do is actually provide a pres um, just an overview of the housing department. There's a lot of different pieces of the department. And um, so I just thought that might be a good way to organize um, my thoughts today. So we'll just kind of walk through the different teams. And, and again, you'll just see how there's different ways that they can interact with, um, with you and your work. So, all right, so who is the housing department? Um, we have actually been around since uh, 1987, uh, the housing department. Not every city has a housing department. It's actually a unique organizational structure. Um, many times it could be actually be like maybe a division within like the like a community development kind of department or you know there's a lot of different structures um, but in San Jose uh, affordable housing has been a long-standing challenge and in the late 1980s um, there was a decision made to actually establish the housing department as a separate entity from at that time, it really, the function sat with the redevelopment agency and 20% uh, of all the redevelopment funds that came in were dedicated to be spent on affordable housing activities. And at that time, in the wisdom of leadership at that point, it really felt like because housing was such a critical issue in San Jose, it really needed to have its own structure. And so um, we've, our department has been around since that long and has reported through the city manager. So the director of housing um, is a direct report to the city manager. Um, and again, at that point, it was actually like taken out of the redevelopment agency, which had a separate organizational structure. Our mission is to strengthen and revitalize our community through housing and neighborhood investment. And our main priorities are to fund new affordable housing, to address the homelessness crisis, and to, pr to protect tenants and landlords' rights. And um, since we have existed, we have funded over 20,000 new homes in San Jose. So we've been busy. And um, as all of you as residents of San Jose, I am sure that um, affordable housing has been a part of your, you know, your community and your life for quite some time. I don't know if I see I have a hand up. Should I take questions along the way or just wait till the end? It doesn't really matter to me. Whatever your preference is, Rachel, we can wait at the end or go by. I had one that came up and I'm happy to wait. Okay, maybe, well, if it's clarifying, just let, but otherwise, like for discussion, let's just wait till the end so I can, I may answer it along the way, you never know. Thanks. Um, all right. So the first division that's, um, that I wanted to talk about is what we call our residential development division. And, um, this whole team provides funding. Really, we act like a bank. So you can really kind of think about that as, a, um, we have a very strong lending team. And what we do is we make funds available. We identify upcoming developments and we provide loans to those developers. Then the developers move forward and build the affordable housing. Now, as we talk about funding construction of housing, we have a lot of language we use. Um, and the most common is the um, area median income. And so we just say AMI. Most of the time we use the acronym AMI. And what I wanted to do is just kind of describe to you what really that means. 
And so when, when funding is used from our uh, programs, what we do is we provide very favorable terms to the developers. They have interest rates that are simple and essentially are between like three and 4% generally, um, which these days sounds even better. But um, they are also have a residual receipt which is kind of a technical word, but what it means is that the loan itself doesn't have an, a regular payment. Instead, on, the development will track all of the rents that come in and then all the expenses. And then at the end, they do the math and determine if there's any money left over. If there is, then a portion of that is actually paid to the city against their loan. But let's say that you know, the, rev the revenue and expenses come in and there's no money left over, then in that case, our loan will receive no payment. So it is a, it is very favorable um, type of debt to have on a building because there can be years where the rents may go up and down and um, the city's loan will, will remain in place, but does not necessarily need payment. So because of that structure, it is very favorable terms. And so what we ask for an exchange from the developer is to provide a restriction on the property to um, restrict the rent to be um, affordable to households within specific income levels. And so what we do in order to calculate all that is we have, um, we take a look at the, the percent of the area median income, and um, that's how we calculate. So we have moderate income homes, and sometimes we use MOD as like an acronym. And these are um, households that have between 80 and 120 of the, of the area median income. And then we have low, very low, and extremely low. And so essentially, um, low is going to be 60% or below, very low is 50, and then extremely low is 30% or below, which sounds all kind of jargony. But on my next slide, this is kind of small, so I apologize, but this is available on our website if you ever are curious. Essentially, what we have is we have the income limits. So you can go if there's four people that live in the household. And we're talking about an extremely low income um, unit, then that family would make $50,550 $50, a year. So that's their annual income. And then you would go down to, let's say they're going to be living in a two bedroom unit, they would be paying $1,137 per year in rent. So this chart is updated every year by our department and is available. And this is how developers and everyone else build their, all of their rent structures. And this is how they determine if they can move forward with their development at these different income levels. So probably, you know, way too much detail, but at least you can try and understand and when we're talking about area median income, we're talking about targeting households with specific incomes and then limiting the rent that they pay long-term. This same team in the housing department also oversees some other programs that are um, critical to, um, to you know, running a lot of these things that, um, end up coming up uh, through planning commission and through the planning process. So another program is our inclusionary housing program. So this program requires that market rate residential developers set aside a, um, a certain percentage of the homes that they build to be affordable. So in San Jose, that requirement is 15%. So what we require is that 5% um, of the units that are built be affordable to 100% of the area median income, which is what we just talked about on the other slide. 
5% at 60 and 5% at 50. So this is, um, this is essentially our core requirement. Now, the way that this program is designed is really has like a menu of options for developers. So they can actually pick and choose. So they can decide that they're gonna build 5% and 100% of the area median income. And then for the remainder, they may choose to pay an in lieu fee. And if they do that, then we will take that money and invest it in, um, we'll turn it back around and fund another developer to build affordable housing somewhere else. They can also dedicate land. Um, they can, I'm just trying to think of all their options. They can, they can cluster. This is a new, uh, a new change that we've made that's actually been fairly popular so far. We've had lots of conversations about it. But what, what it means is that the market rate developer can actually, um, let's say they have room on their site for three towers. So tower number one and tower number two are market rate. And then what they do is they take the space for tower number three and actually work with an affordable developer or they can actually develop it themselves and have all the units in tower number three are restricted affordable. And so, and those, the units in that third affordable building need to provide what's required when you consider all the market rate units that are built on in tower one and two. So anyway, um, what, again, what the clustering allows is to take all the affordable and put it into one building. And um, that's, that's actually a pretty new idea, but has been something that people are looking at doing. So otherwise this general requirement requires that the affordable units be spread out within the market rate units like they're all mixed in you know they're not like pulled off on a back corner of a building or something so anyway so that's kind of a new concept we also have um this team also implements our replacement housing requirements which is a, um, a new obligation under SB 330, which is state law that says, if, if a developer is building residential, but they're um, basically demolishing existing housing in order to build more housing, then they need to replace that housing in their new development if, that, if they are serving low-income households. So our team work, um, has been working with the planning team and trying to figure this all out. But basically what needs to happen is we need to evaluate the income levels of everyone living in those units and then um, determine what rights they have long-term and of the existing tenants. But also it influences the shape of the new structure because a portion of those, the number of units that are demolished in order to create the new ones have to be replaced in the new building. And those uh, units are gonna be an income restricted as well. Um, we also, this team also manages our commercial linkage fee, which is a, um, a fee that is charged for commercial properties. Um, and then those funds again are managed by this team to create new affordable housing in, in new places. All right, I'm just gonna keep going. Now that was all really one division <laughs> of the housing department, probably the one that interacts the most um, with planning. We also have our rent stabilization program. Um, so essentially San Jose has um, several different ordinances that have been put in place that restrict the rents that can be charged um, in apartments that were built prior to um, 1979. So that's kind of like a random year, but the reason is because that's when San Jose passed its apartment rent ordinance to begin with, like the very first time. And subsequently in 1995, there was a state law passed Costa Hawkins, which says 
there may not be any new rent control. So on as soon as that state law was passed, then our law like kind of became um, the limit for anything that can be rent controlled in San Jose. So essentially, um, any building that has three units or more that was built before 1979 is subject to the apartment rent ordinance. Now, I wanted to bring up the Ellis Act ordinance um, as well, because this ordinance, it's, a, it's kind of a, the same concept, if you will, as like replacement housing. It's a little bit different though. And what this one says is we don't want to lose any rent controlled units over time. So if there's demolition involved in new construction of a unit that's covered by the apartment rent ordinance, then those units need to be um, basically replaced in the new development as well. And so there's a whole process for that. Um, also, just as um, something that's been really important through the whole pandemic, we also have established an eviction help center and eviction prevention clinic. And so there's a whole group that manages that as well. Now, another key group is our homelessness response team. I think it's really important for everyone to understand that we have um, over 6,000 people who are sleeping on our streets in San Jose every night. Um, we have been actually very successful in finding housing solutions for our homeless population and have ha housed um, thousands of folks over the last two years even. Um, but what's happening is there's the number of people who are falling into homelessness every day is outpacing our pro progress in trying to find solutions. So, so this has been, um, this just continues to be a really strong priority for our city. There's many different ways that we do that work. Um, but we definitely believe that um, creating supportive housing is a solution to homelessness. Creating a home for someone to live in is actually the one way that that person, you know, is no longer homeless, right? So, so we have, we work very closely with the county, with um, nonprofits, and what we have been really focusing on over the last couple of years is to create supportive housing, which means as we build apartments, we are also creating services that are provided to the residents there so that as they can move in from, um, from homelessness, they can establish themselves and access the services they need and become more and more independent. So this actually is a picture here of a, um, this is Emmanuel Sobrato, which is under construction right now. And it is 100% permanent supportive housing. And so what we mean permanent supportive housing is a term that means everyone who is in a unit for permanent supportive housing was formerly homeless. So it's a, it's a home for, it's targeted housing for a homeless population. Um, we also have rapid rehousing, which is a different program, which basically provides uh, services for a shorter period of time than permanent supportive housing but it's also a type of, of housing that we use as we build our um, new apartments. I also just wanted to point out, we have a destination home planner who sits in the planning department. They're funded by destination home. That's why they are called that. Um, but what that planner does is focuses on any development that has 25% per, uh, of supportive housing coming through the door. Um, they are actually assigned to a specific planner who has learned about um, all of these affordable housing programs and just really kind of helps to build an understanding with developers who are coming through with um, this type of housing um, and also just to provide to them uh, the support they need in the planning department. Um, so yeah, another, another type of 
development that we've been doing in order to respond to our homelessness crisis is interim housing, which is different in the sense that um, people who are living there are, are not paying rent. So they're living, it's essentially a shelter, um, but there's shelter looks very different, I would say, than what you might picture in your mind. Um, in the past, sh um, homeless shelters generally may look like a like a gym with um, stacks of of um, bunk beds and cots and that kind of thing. Um, but what we have really been moving to towards, um, especially since COVID, is non congregate shelter, which means that people have their own space. And so we've been. Um, this is just an example here of like tiny homes where everyone has their own space. And um, this is definitely something that we've been working on quite a bit recently. All right, then we have a policy team and this policy team actually work, leads on um, all kinds of exploring lots of different ideas for housing solutions in San Jose. They also lead our legislative efforts um and are really the team that's been working on the housing element the housing element update with our planning team and so you can see here these are the goals we have for our city and our uh, our upcoming housing element update and um the number of um very very low low and moderate income housing units that are needed in our city are quite significant. Um, and so really, in order to create thousands and thousands of units here, um, we really need to have many, many, many different solutions and, and strategies in order to meet these goals. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight, we also have a grants team who um, distributes over $75 million in grants. That number actually really grew through uh, the pandemic because there were so many federal funds that flowed through in order to create housing solutions. So this group has um, been busy, um, but they um, reach, yeah, thousands of residents just through many different programs that they, that they um, work, work for and support. And that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take questions and I can pop back to any slides if we want to pull them back up. No problem. Thanks, Rachel. I had that one question in your first slide. You mentioned how the redevelopment agency produced oh. 21,000 units of low income housing. Yes. Does the department track how many units have been created since then? So that the number is something higher than 21,000 that San Jose has oh. done? I see what your question is. So 21,000 is as of today. So it, it include it just includes the whole housing department's experience. So some of that is redevelopment days and some of it is after. It's, it's just um, from 1987 to 2022. So that's the aggregate number of low income units that have been built in San Jose. And that could be redevelopment funding that could be privately funded, it could be whatever, but that's the number so far. Yes. And then uh, one more question. Is there a, a number of entitled units that that has passed entitlement but have yet to be built? I imagine that number is well above a thousand. That's interesting. Um, I would say, um, so again, we have different processes for affordable housing on, um, you know, going through entitlement. So I didn't even, there's so much I could talk about. Anyway, there, there is, for example, SB 35 um, is a state law where what the developer does is comes through and um, works through a ministerial process. Um, and so they can actually, once they get, they complete that process and have a permit, they're entitled. Right. Um, so but I would say that we have really been working on getting the, the date of entitlement, then they get their, they have to have their entitlement before they can actually get a funding commitment from the, from our team, because we can't have the council make like a $10 million commitment on something that's not entitled, like that's out of order. 
So basically, I would say that we have refined this process so that the affordable housing development gets entitled, gets funded very quickly to, to count following that date. And then they submit in to for state funding. Um, so they're going to apply for tax credits and um, everything else again very quickly. So, and then once they're funded, they move forward. So we just try and have that time from entitlement to, to funding be maybe like a six to nine month period um, if possible. So I wouldn't say that we have too many that are entitled but aren't funded. You see what I mean? I do, but I've also witnessed things have been entitled and they haven't been built for years and they were uh, designated low income projects, but I could take that offline. I don't want to take up the time. Yeah, that's fine. I would say there, there may be a few, but most of them are just cooking through the process. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Commissioner Lardenois. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentation, Rachel. Um, this is a little off topic, so please feel free to keep it brief, but um, uh, I came of age after the 2008 recession and when the state abolished redevelopment agencies. So when they're discussed, it's always a little mystifying to me. If you could just briefly go over what their role was and powers and all that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I, actually, that's an excellent question. It's very relevant to affordable housing in San Jose. It, it's a deep part of our history. So, um, so that's, that's fine. Um, okay, so essentially, Redevelopment agencies had the ability to create its create maps. So they would take like a certain area, okay, in the city, and they would draw a line around it. And this is the redevelopment area, okay. And then at that time, what happened is the property taxes for that geographic area were were essentially like frozen. So whatever when that redevelopment area was established, whatever those property taxes were then it, it, that became like a baseline. So then over time, as investments were made in that area and the property values um, for that area increased, then the increase in property tax collected from that area is called the property tax increment, okay? So basically a baseline is set and then over time there's more more value, more value, more value. And then this difference was called the property tax increment. And all of the property tax increment went back to the redevelopment agency to reinvest in those areas again. So it was like, it was, it's a tool that was used to um, redevelop specific areas. So Thank in San Jose, okay. uh, so then the, how housing is all tied into this is that the state law required that 20% of all of the tax increment be spent on affordable housing. And so over time, that 20% had to be invested in affordable housing rather than um, like an economic development type of investment, right? You know, like a, you know, a, a facade or, a, you know what I mean? Like a something to fix up a business district or, you know, something like that. It, um, that's what the 80% the was spent on. And then the 20% was uh, dedicated to affordable housing programs. All right, that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Young. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rachel, for the presentation. Um, it was really, really helpful. I have a question. Could you explain what the RHNA goals are? Oh, yeah. So is there an acronym called RINA for that? Because I've been at conferences and hear people talk about that. I know, you know, and I should have spelled out my acronym. That was like the point of this, right? So I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. So it's the um, Regional Housing Needs Allocation. Okay, that's what this all spells out. And so what happens is um, the ABAG, which is the associated, whatever, but I'm like, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, um, a big entity. <laughs> Association like, of Area Governments. Thank you. I'm like, what are they? Okay. The Association of Bay Area Governments actually does a study and determines based on your jurisdiction, what 
how much housing you need, okay, like based on population growth and they're looking they're looking over time as well they're you know so they're looking at like how much you need now but they're also looking at like a um like an eight year horizon okay so they're saying in san jose in order to meet all the needs of the population that exists now and will be growing into the next eight years san jose will need sixty two thousand new homes okay so 62,000 new housing units. And then they don't just leave it there and say, you know, you just need 62,000. They go on and break it down by income level, right? So um, so again, like if, if we looked at like this 27, this is above moderate. So this is what I would consider market rate housing, right? So um, what's an example, right? across the street from city hall there's the miro so that's like a, a brand new housing it's like two towers and that would be considered above moderate income housing because it's not restricted the rents aren't restricted to any specific income level so there's that's one group that needs to be built right so that's twenty seven thousand of those units but then if you think about very low income and extremely low income, these are combined, we need 15,000 of these units. Now that, if you think that since 1987, we've built 20,000, I mean, to think of what 15,000 is, this is a massive effort. Um, and then um, in addition to that, there's another 8,600 for low. And then this moderate income is also interesting because 10,000, again, these are, big numbers, um, we actually don't have much of a set up program specifically to moderate income housing. So, so we're trying to think about different strategies on how to um, meet this goal. But what the housing element does in the general plan is it actually talks through goals and strategies in order to meet this need of the, this housing need in our, in our city. Great. So are these the goals in the next eight years that we have to meet? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And is there a consequence if we don't meet them? <sighs> um, I'm trying to think. Will we meet our arena goals? Yeah. What happens if we don't meet our arena goals? Um, I don't believe a whole lot. So, I mean, the one thing that can happen, right? So, um, so let me just say this: no cities have been meeting their um, affordable goals except Beverly Hills had like five, six, seven nanny units that they built, and that's not a joke. I'm being serious. Um, so, no other jurisdiction has met, I've, I've heard has met their affordable, and most jurisdictions meet their above market rate or market rate housing. It's not a problem. So um, I'm not aware of any consequences, but the consequences that do exist already exist for us. And that is, if you don't meet your affordable um, RENA goals, you SB 35 uh, law come, kicks in and developers can use streamlining for projects that have um, streamlining ministerial approval for projects that have 50% of the units or more that are affordable. Um, and of course, no one really builds projects that are 50% market rate and 50% affordable. So it's basically projects that are 100% affordable um, have a streamlining process. Yeah. Um, and that applies to San Jose because we don't meet our low income requirements or arena goals. Um, our affordable. So how about the builders remedy? That's different. So that's a whole different thing. So. Um, if you don't meet your uh, arena goals for market rate, then uh, market rate developers also can do streamlining and ministerial approval if they include 20% of the units as affordable. But um, that's something that hasn't applied to us yet because we consistently meet our market rate goals, our arena goals. Okay, great. Time check, two minutes. Time check, two minutes. Okay. Robert, you're saying to keep us on schedule, we need uh, just two minutes left on this topic? Yes, please. And there will be additional time for public comments after. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get uh, brief questions from Commissioner Barosio and Commissioner Nellis Wise. Commissioner Barosio? 
Hi, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, uh, mine's mine's fairly uh, basic. Um, in the chart that broke down uh, the residential department division, um, what would the AMI um, band of 60 to 80 percent be called? Thank you. You know, it's interesting that you asked that because as I was typing this, I'm like, you know, it's kind of an obvious question. You know, if there's someone as smart as you paying attention, you might notice that there's nothing between 60 and 80. <laughs> um, we've struggled with this. I think we would just continue to call it moderate, but it, you know how I was saying, even in the arena goals, there's this moderate, we just don't have like a whole lot of structure for our moderate income. The reality is usually when we talk about moderate, we're talking about 20, uh, 80 to 120 because we're thinking about, um, we're thinking about home ownership because typically that's the, the, the group of people who would be buying a home um, or might qualify for like a home buyer program. But we also have these renters who may be between 60 and 80, and we don't really have a whole lot of programming for them, um, which we're trying to think through. So I guess you would just call it moderate income renters, maybe, or, or I don't know. It's just like another layer of moderate income. Um, but low is not higher than 60. I guess that's the point. So. Okay. And then. And then if responses can be brief as well, Commissioner Ornelas Wise, with your question. Um, I, I have some comments. Thank you, Rachel, for the, for the, question, uh, for the presentation. Um, I'd like to see some of that temporary housing, which I think is fantastic, um, be recycled. I don't know how long the people that are in there stay, but I, I don't know exactly what you're all doing to take them from temporary housing to maybe affordable homeownership opportunities. Um, I just like to see them move out to apartment, to duplex, to house, to then maybe owning a home, mm -hmm. um, something like that. Um, RV parks, I don't know what you're doing uh, because obviously we have a lot of people living in their cars and I know you have the safe, safe park or you know park mm -hmm. parking lot, something or other. Um, but I'd like to see the city maybe um, do a little bit more with opening up RV parks for affordable, oh, options for people to maybe permanently live in. Um, obviously there's a lot along Monterey Road, maybe um, something similar to that um, in, in different places of the city. I also would like to see that affordable housing is not just clustered in one district. Um, I'm in district seven and it seems like there's a lot of stuff that's built here, which is fantastic, but I just wanna make sure that there's an even distribution throughout the whole city because this is a citywide um, issue. And so um, I think that it should be equally distributed. Um, another thing that I wanted to say was, um, have you considered uh, dorm-like housing for um, housing the homeless? Um, just Those are just some of my thoughts, um, things that I wanted to share. I wish we had more time to talk about all this. Um, but um, I think you're doing a fantastic job and, and continue. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, I'm definitely hearing all your comments, so thank you. Can I just ask one quick question? Just one question. What is Cantrell, I guess uh, if Robert says it's okay, he wants to keep us on a tight schedule of learning. You, you can get back to me later. You don't have to answer now. But what are the, the, the biggest obstacles to meeting the housing element? Um, so, you know, one or two, you don't have to answer now, but I'm really focused on what blockages that we can help resolve. That's it. Okay. Um, no, that's a great question. I would just say the first two, the top two things are sites, just finding space, um, which actually in the housing element, we've done a big effort in trying to identify sites, which is, is a, a big part of the problem. And then second is funding. Um, you know, we, we uh, our most recent notice of funding availability, we were oversubscribed um, by probably $30 million. So it's, you know, we have more, there are more developers that want to do this work than there is money to go around. So those are our biggest challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, from our city attorney's office, Mark Vini, to talk to us about the current legislative changes and updates. All right, thank you for that. Can uh, everybody hear me? Yes. 
Great. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, hopefully this all works. Um, so yes, I'm here to provide a legislative update to everybody. Um, and the probably good uh, segue from the affordable housing discussion because much of the work that's been done in the California legislature over this last year, as well as uh, the last couple of years related to planning and land use has to do with housing, uh, ensuring that housing can be built um, expeditiously and in more locations in order to um, alleviate the housing crisis uh, that's uh, plaguing the state. And indeed, it's, it's probably the, the most pressing issue that the state of California is facing. Um, so many of these uh, bills uh, that I'm going to be talking about all deal with housing. I think just about every single one of them deals with housing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, this is my first time providing this update. I'll be focusing on laws that were passed in 2022, although I will touch on uh, some bills that were passed uh, in 2019 and then augmented in 2021. I'm not providing a comprehensive summary here and many of the legislation that the state has passed uh, in the last uh, few years is quite complicated, quite comprehensive. So if there are any specific questions, I'll do my best to answer. Um, however, those uh, answers may need to be something I get back to you all later on. But I'm going to move on and start with uh, the first law. So SB 330 and SB 8, this is the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. So this was signed into law in 2019, um, and it was augmented by SB 8 in 2021. Uh, the Planning Commission, commissioners may already be aware of this law, but I wanted to talk about it because it is uh, landmark legislation that the state passed, um, and it is quite uh, ex expansive, so too much to explain in a, a short presentation like this. I want to be sensitive to everybody's time, uh, but the gist of uh, the Housing Crisis Act is it prohibits local jurisdictions from enacting new laws that would have the effect of reducing the legal limit on new housing within their borders or delay new housing by administrative or other regulatory barriers. Um, there was a mention of the building builder's remedy, uh, which I'll touch on a little bit, um, and that has to do with uh, the housing element, and, and part of the builder's remedy comes out of SB 330 and, and this legislation. So the gist of the builder's remedy is that um, jurisdictions uh, in the northern part of California have to submit and have their housing element approved uh, by uh, HED, which is the uh, state's housing department, by January 1st, 2023. Many jurisdictions are unlikely to have uh, their housing element approved by that deadline. And what the building builder's remedy does is it streamlines. It's a it's a, intended to be a punitive measure, uh, but it's streamline. It's a streamlining tool that provides developers the option to file an application for a housing development with at least twenty percent affordable housing uh, that is not in conformance with the jurisdiction zoning or general plan. So there has been some news about the builder's remedy in planning circles over the last uh, couple of weeks because of a, uh, an erroneous interpretation of what uh, uh, was thought to be a grace period of 120 days. Apparently, HED uh, had advised that that grace period is not, in fact, applicable here. So it is something that the planning commission should be aware of, even though many of the projects that would qualify under the builder's remedy would not come to the planning commission for um, any, any type of um, zoning approval or anything like that. Um, although you may be able to, there are some discussions about the extent to which the building builder's remedy is subject to CEQA and how CEQA can be used uh, to uh, deal with that. Um, and one thing that SB 8 and SB 330, well, SB 8 did is ex extend the statewide housing emergency uh, through 2030. So more about SB 330, I mean, this is a, long list of bullet points of what it does. As I mentioned, it prevents uh, local, well, one, it prevents local governments from downzoning unless they upzone an equivalent amount elsewhere within their borders. City of San Jose actually has a carve out for it where we can bank, um, uh, we can downs, we can upzone and bank and staff probably has a better explanation as to what that actually does. Uh, but there is a carve out for this, uh, for the city of San Jose. Uh, it suspends the enactment of local downzoning and housing construction moratoriums. Uh, important, uh, uh, important change is that it requires timely processing of housing permits that follow zoning rules. It limits the number of hearings that you can have. Um, 
it uh, ensures the demolition of housing does not result in net loss of units, uh, postpones requirements for voter approval of zoning, general plan changes. That's not something that's really applicable to San Jose, uh, but it is in other jurisdictions and uh, requires resettlement benefits and first right of refusal and new units or compensation for rehousing for renters who may be displaced. Uh, it's quite comprehensive legislation. Um, I also wanted to talk about SB 1333. So this is passed in 2018, it's nothing new, uh, but it is something I wanted to draw the planning uh, commission's attention to because it is something that the city is, is uh, doing periodically on a regular basis. And what SB 1333 does is it requires charter cities to align their zoning districts with general plan land use designation. So charter cities previously were not required to have consistency between their zoning uh, ordinances and their uh, land use, uh, general plan land use designations uh, within their city. Um, and there was a whole process to rezone that and, and SB 13833 uh, now requires that type of consistency. So uh, periodically uh, planning staff will bring a rezoning ordinance worth a number of parcels that need to be made consistent with the general plan. And so it's something that is done. I think I'm, in my time on this assignment, I've looked at maybe four or five of those ordinances uh, and the council regularly takes it up. They don't go to the, the next. Uh, oh, they don't sorry, go Ron? to the planning commission. Now, just be able, the planning commission be aware of that. They go right to council. Correct. Yeah, and and thanks thanks for that, Michael. A number of these laws, just so the planning commission is aware, is uh, you know streamlining ministerial approval of projects. And so I'm bringing it to the planning commission's attention because these you know statewide laws are are taking away local control quite a bit from jurisdictions putting it in the hands of you know, staff to review whether or not a project complies or not with um, a particular objective standard. And if it does, then ministerial approval is required. And what ministerial approval means is approval by right. So if you meet the criteria, then you get your permit or your, your project approved. And so uh, many of these laws, not this one that I have up on the screen, but many of these laws uh, will be taking projects that may have come before the planning commission in the past out of the planning commission's jurisdiction. But SB6 is not one of them. Uh, it's referred to as the Middle Class Housing Act of 2022. Um, it deems a housing development uh, project as defined under the law, uh, an allowable use on a parcel that is within a zone where office, retail, or parking are principally permitted use. Uh, if certain conditions are met, um, as far as notice, density, things like that. Um, it doesn't create a ministerial approval pro a requirement, which means that it is still subject to discretionary approval of uh, you know, planning commissioners and uh, city council, depending on, on um, uh, what is being done. Um, it does have prevailing wage and skilled and trained workforce requirements. That's another thing that you see in a number of these uh, housing laws that came out in 2022. They also double as what I would consider a jobs uh, bills where they require you know, prevailing wage, skilled and trained workforce. And then it also provides um, certain um, enforcement benefits to labor organizations uh, in the event that these rules are not followed. Um, SB6 is effective July 1st, 2023, and it will uh, through January 1st, 2033. Uh, the next bill is AB 2011. Uh, it's known as the Affordable Housing and High Road Jobs Act of 2022. Um, somewhat similar to SB 6 because it deals with uh, development in uh, commercial office retail area areas. Um, unlike SB 6, it does create a ministerial approval process and it would authorize a development uh, proponent to submit an application for a housing development that meets a specified objective standards and affordability site criteria um, and in, in certain areas, but including office retail or parking uh, where that's a principal, principally permitted use. Um, and, it, and it would allow housing to be built by right in those, in those areas. Um, and it's uh, the affordability requirements, 100% uh, affordable to lower income households will be allowed, um, or at least 15% of the units would be, and at least 15% of the units would be required to be affordable to lower income households. Uh, for, um, uh, excuse me, for uh, rent projects uh, alternatively, uh, or provide at least 8% of the units for very low income households and 5% for extremely low income households. Um, and then for sale projects could alternatively provide 30% of their units uh, for moderate income households. 
Uh, the next bill is uh, AB 916. Uh, it deals with, um, uh, prohibits the city from adopting or enforcing an ordinance requiring a public hearing as a condition of reconfiguring existing space to increase the bedroom count in an existing dwelling unit. Again, I don't know if this is something that would normally come before the Planning Commission, uh, but, it, but it is a, a, a bill that uh, limits uh, what uh, the number of hearings that a city can require uh, when somebody wants to expand a, an existing unit. For the next bill, and I'm moving along pretty quick here, so we might uh, uh, be able to uh, move a little faster on our, on our schedule here. Uh, but the next bill is AB 2221, uh, deals with ADU construction. Uh, and this law prohibits local governments from requiring a zoning clearance or separate zoning review, uh, prevents local governments from imposing front setbacks, front setbacks if they would prevent ADU, that is at least 800 square feet, uh, restricts the ability of a, a local government to impose height limits, clarifies that a detached ADU can include a detached garage, and it allows developers to add ADUs to their properties with proposed multifamily buildings, which is an important, um, uh, important change, uh, and confirms that only objective standards may be used for their review. So um, that's another thing that many of the housing laws that have been passed in the last couple of years try to strengthen is make the criteria for approving or denying a project subject to objective standards as opposed to objective standards like, you know, does it fit with the neighborhood character or something like that. Uh, in short, AB 2221 uh, makes it easier for property owners to get their ADUs approved and restricts the ability of the government to impose development standards on these kind of units. Uh, the next bill is uh, SB 897, um, and it deletes uh, a, a sunset uh, provision, a 2025 sun sunset provision in a current statute. Uh, which prohibits a local agency from imposing an owner-occupied requirement um, such that now there is no owner-occupied requirement for ADUs and junior ADUs. Uh, SB 897 also prohibits a local agency from denying a permit for an unpermitted ADU because of a building standard violation, violation unless it's a health and safety violation. Um, furthermore, um, it uh, proposes grant funding for constructions of ADUs. Um, and, uh, it, and it has to do with some, there's some easing of fire sprinkler requirements and, and things like that. Uh, in addition, um, it increases the max, maximum height to 18 feet um, in high transit areas. Um, and uh, for detached ADUs and properties that contain multi-story, multi-family buildings. Um, and then for all attached ADU, ADUs, the new height maximum is 25 feet. And previously, uh, cities had to allow uh, 16 feet heights for ADUs. And then the next uh, bill, um, AB 2334, uh, it amends uh, the density bonus law. And density bonus law is a tool that developers have if they meet certain affordability requirements, they can uh, waive certain development standards uh, or get certain concessions on requirements. And so there's a distinction between a, a waiver and a concession and, a, and the city is uh, uh, limited, uh, particularly with concessions, we can reject them only if they meet, uh, if, if they would create certain health and safety um, risks. Uh, but uh, AB 2334 uh, allows a housing development in, um, uh, 17 specified counties, including Santa, and Santa Clara County is included in that. Um, and it allows uh, uh, a development that meets that affordability requirement, meets the affordability requirements to receive added height and then limit and, and density um, if the project is located in an urbanized, as the statute refers, very low vehicle travel area, um, so long as at least uh, 80% of the units are restricted to lower income households and no more than 20% are for moderate income households. And low, very low vehicle travel area means an urbanized area as designated by the United States Census Bureau where the existing residential development generates vehicle miles traveled per capita that is below 85% of either regional vehicle miles traveled per capita or city vehicle miles traveled per capita. 
And so with that, Bill, that that concludes my, uh, you know, what, what I wanted to talk about. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer uh, and take them into consideration. If there's any law here that you're aware of or want more information on that I didn't cover, please feel free to contact me or let me know and, and we can provide a summary of that for you all. Thanks, Mark. Hey, Mark, quick question on AB 203034. Uh, I don't know how many threes I added there, but on uh, <laughs> don't some cities get into legal entanglements when their uh, elected bodies or appointed bodies uh, reject a density project and then they open the municipality up to litigation? Potentially, uh, yes. I mean, that's that's the thing. There is a whole process even within our city uh, to deal with density bonus uh, requests. And our density bonus ordinance does go a little bit further than what the state requires. But yes, I mean, that, that has opened up. Uh, I believe the city of San Diego had a big case uh, dealing with a density bonus um, a dispute. Um, and there was another case in the city is escaping me, but, but that is something that has occurred. I think it's Santa Monica and Santa Cruz. Um, but thank yeah. you. I see Commissioner Young has his hand up. Commissioner Young. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Um, my question is on, there's two bills that you went over that allow housing to be built on current commercial properties. And it looked like one was ministerial approval and one was not. And I'm trying to understand the difference. Sure. So the, the one that was ministerial was SB, excuse me, AB 2011. And the distinction there was that it, it, it required certain affordability. Uh, so affordable housing on commercially zoned lands. And that's what, you know, if a developer was going to be uh, providing housing that met that standard, uh, then they would get ministerial, uh, they would have a ministerial process. My understanding of SB 6, though, is that it just opens up certain corridors to uh, uh, that uh, certain office and commercial corridors to that uh, to development, but it, it doesn't mandate any affordability. Uh, so you don't get an administrative or ministerial approval process. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Ornelas Wise. Hi, Mark. I have a quick question on AB 2221. I'm just trying to understand. So that basically allows anybody to put an ADU in their front yard and don't require the front setbacks. Is that correct? Did I understand you right? Yeah, it, it prevents the local government from imposing front setbacks if they would prevent an ADU that is at least 800 square feet. So I, I and the purpose behind it is to just make it easier to build ADUs. I don't know how it's going to work. I will defer to staff if they're familiar with well, just to quickly it, clarify, with it a little bit more. If they have that, the ability to put it in their backyard, they need to put it there. But if there's not an ability to put it because of restraints or anything else, the law allows them to put it in the front. So that's the hard part of interpretation is what makes it in, incapable of putting it in the backyard. And that's where it's a little gray. Yeah, that makes more sense, John. Thank you so much. Um, and on SB 897, um, so even an unpermitted structure that was maybe on someone's property could be converted into an ADU per SB 897. Is that correct? Yeah, so long as it doesn't pose a health and safety <laughs> risk, then, then it could. Okay, good. No, thanks. And Mark, SB 9 is ministerial, so that's out of your uh, presentation as well. Yeah, I, I wanted to focus on, you know, I touched on SB 330 and SB 8, but I, I, I wanted to focus on the new legislation, uh, especially those that were creating ministerial processes such that they'll take these projects away from the Planning Commission and the City Council. But yes, SB 9 is ministerial, and, and there's also SB 10 as well, which does um, has to do with uh, CEQA and zoning, and, and those are other big housing laws that were passed in, I believe, 2019. Commissioner Ornelas Wise, do you have an additional question? Yeah, I do. Just, um, I think it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, AB2011. Is that the one where you could have housing on commercial property? Yes. If it's affordable, if it meets certain affordability criteria, then it would, uh, it would be able to take advantage of a ministerial process. I just wanted to ask staff, um, 
how, how often or how many of these have you seen, if any at all? Well, so the bill is is not in effect yet. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the, the date is July 1st when it goes into effect. That's correct. Um, yeah, so anyway, so that hasn't gone into effect yet. I just want to note, look, the plan commission might be interested in this, actually, that planning staff, so Martina Davis, as well as Jared from OED, who's kind of on our team, um, actually worked with the author uh, um, in, uh, I think it was Buffy Wicks, right? His, her office to write, to actually craft that bill. Um, we had a lot of concerns about it when it first came out. And unlike in other legislator offices, the author of that bill was an urban planner from the city of San Francisco, actually, or former city of San Francisco planner. And so we, our staff were able to work with him, including me to actually um, shape that bill in a way that was largely consistent with our general plan policies regarding affordable housing and where it can go. Um, and also restricted it um, so that you couldn't convert industrial property. That was a really our biggest concern because um, we generally have ways to allow uh, commercial properties to be converted to affordable, um, and it's more or less consistent with this law. So, um, yeah, so we work really closely with them on that. So it was a really, uh, it was a very, it ended up being a fairly positive outcome. I mean, the truth be known, we don't rather the state don't come and mess with our businesses, right? And just give us local control. And even though we're kind of doing a lot of the same work with the state is we rather have more flexibility. But in this case, um, we actually work with the author and, and did it in a way that kind of uh, reduced our concerns here. No, that's really glad. I'm really glad to hear. I mean, just because you know, it seems like everyone's working from home if someone has, or, you know, I mean, the, my only concern with the affordability is, you know, what if someone purchases a commercial building and wants to live and operate out of it? Would they be able to, or because of their income, not be able to, and it would only be like their staff, but what if it's like a one, like a, you know, someone that's like a solo, uh, you know, someone that's just running a Yeah, I mean, we have to look into that, but remember, there's two laws. There's the one that's affordable AB 2011 has affordability criteria and there's another one SB 6 that doesn't right so I think um, now you probably would have to use union labor when, <laughs> when you want to do the improvements for your little unit upstairs but um, you know I think there is a probably a path in, in that situation under one of those bills probably SB 6 in that case. Thank you Michael. I will add that um, you know this these bills were very much um, there was I, I, there were the unions that aligned with 2011 and there were other unions that aligned with SB6 and it was kind of a situation where um, unions were pitted against unions and so it was kind of an uncomfortable situation for our democratic progressive uh, legislature and and, and the, the governor so what they did is they just signed let's sign both let's go for both um, so that that's kind of what one of the things that happened. Um, but that being said, I think for better or worse, depending on your perspective, we're not anticipating a lot of development under SB6 because of the requirements for bailing wage, AKA union labor, just um, because uh, market rate developers are generally adverse to committing to that. And so because of that, even though it looks good on paper, I we don't anticipate there's gonna be a lot of market rate development converting commercial land under this bill now affordable we think it could actually help with affordable and result in affordable housing developers typically use um do prevailing wage and rachel probably knows more about why but i think it's a requirement off another funding for example from the city yeah anyone else on this topic from the commission I guess we can move on to the next one, Robert. All I'd say is all these laws are a variety of people having opinions on them, but unless you have a private property owner that wants to go develop the land, nothing happens. So it takes that initiative from the private property owner side of the fence. Great, we are just on time. It's break time until 3 p.m., 15 minutes break.
Planning, see the wide planning division to talk to us about general plan house and element subjects. Ruth, the ball is in your court. Thank you. Um, I think Jennifer will be sharing my presentation. Um, there we go. We see it. Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Ruth Gueto. I am a supervising planner and I oversee the housing team and planning. Um, I am also uh, working collaboratively with the housing department on the housing element update, and I'm the project manager on the planning side. I'm here to provide a high level overview of the housing element update process, which is currently underway. And just so you know, there is a study session scheduled for November 16th, I think. Uh, we're, we'll discuss in more detail the actual draft document itself and the findings, the site's inventory, programs and policies and such. Next slide, please. So the housing element is the city's official housing policy document. It's required by state law and incorporated into each city's general plan to guide housing policy. San Jose's current housing element expires in 2023. Our six cycle housing element will go from 2023 to 2031. It's due to the state of California Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, early next year. And um, this is also an important opportunity to have a conversation with our residents and stakeholders about how San Jose will grow and develop. Um, in the context of what we put into the housing element is very important. City Council will adopt this plan and it's when they adopt it, it's saying that they will commit to what is in the plan in terms of policies and programs. As you've uh, probably heard or I think uh, received from the previous presentations, the state is increasingly um, uh, increasing their enforcement capabilities to follow up with cities that don't do what they say they will do in their housing elements. And um, they actually have hired a whole enforcement unit and they have the power to refer cities directly to the attorney general for action. Uh, we do not expect that um, um, to be something that San Jose would face, just given that we are a leader in housing, but we note this to illustrate that this is not a casual plan. It's official and important, and we are being careful with what goes in the plan so we can keep our word. Next slide. So since 1969, the state of California has required the local governments to adequately plan to meet the housing needs of everyone in their communities through the development of housing elements. The laws that govern this process are collectively known as the state housing element law. 
the Regional Housing Needs Allocation Process, or RENA, as you've heard and you'll continue hearing throughout this presentation, it's a uh, part of the state's housing element law and it's used to determine how many new homes and the affordability of those homes that local governments have to plan for in their housing elements. For this six cycle, for the Bay Area nine county region, our RENA is 441,176 new homes. It's a 135% increase from the fifth cycle, um, but not as high as anticipated in um, other areas like um, the Los Angeles metro area that saw 225% increase from the fifth to the sixth cycle. Um, the Regional Council of Governments in the Bay Area, I'm sorry, the State Department of Housing and Community Development first determines each region's housing need by income level for the planning period. Then it goes to the Regional Council of Governments, in this case, ABAG, um, and then they allocate RENA shares to each jurisdiction using a methodology developed by the Regional Council and required by state law to include specific variables. Local governments participate in the development of the allocation methodology and are required to update their housing elements to show how they'll accommodate that share of RENA. They're required to demonstrate that they have enough land, vacant or feasible for redevelopment and zone to accommodate their assigned housing units at all income levels. Next slide. Um, so ABAG established a housing methodology committee um, to develop that draft methodology. They met um, 12 times between 2019 and 2020, and it consisted of 37 members representing multiple jurisdictions. Michael Brio, our deputy director, was a member of that committee. Next slide. So this table shows RENA allocations across the nine counties in terms of percentages. Uh, for Santa Clara County, the total is 129,927 units that we have to plan for. Um, let's see. So um, these goals were developed by um, first starting with a forecast of the following decade, looking at the current supply of housing versus the need, and developing the number of units for each region. Um, the housing need is generally based on uh, natural growth, so people having children and families growing, people moving in from other places, as well as economic growth. The Bay Area allocated its RENA according to a somewhat complicated methodology, that, um, but it's consistent with the Plan Bay Area 2050. That plan talks about how we'll grow as a region, how we will become more equitable and combat climate change. The final methodology took into account each city's presence of high opportunity areas and access to jobs and transit. San Jose received about 14% of the Bay Area's goals. It's smaller than the percentage from the last cycle when we received about 18.5%. Other cities in the Bay Area received goals of three to four times what they had in the last cycle, cities like Palo Alto and Cupertino, um, mainly because of the uh, presence of high opportunity areas in those cities. Next slide. This chart breaks down the city's new Reno goals to accommodate the 62,200 new housing units. It breaks it down by income level. Um, and just to note that very low income also includes a subset of extremely low income. That's how we've been reporting our Reno goals, um, at least through the fifth cycle, possibly the fourth cycle. Um, the second column defines how much of the total RENA goal is for each category. So 55% for the first three rows, and then 45% are above mod or market rate. And then the last column shows the increase between our current um, cycle and then this one and the increase. Overall, we're seeing a 77% increase from fifth cycle to sixth cycle. And um, just want to clarify that the city's requirement for these goals is not to build the housing itself. It's to plan to accommodate housing need by putting in place land use policies, taking planning actions such as zonings and executing um, on its policy and program work plan to further fair housing objectives and reduce barriers to housing production and preservation. Next slide. So what's in a housing element? There are several parts of the housing element, including um, studies and analyses like those that look at the housing that we have now and what 
type of housing is needed, uh, whether it's single family, multifamily, affordable market rate. We also look at um, and evaluate constraints or issues that make it um, hard to develop housing. And we look at both governmental constraints, so whether it's heights, zoning, um, policies, and non-governmental constraints, which include um, construction costs, cost for land, things outside of the government's control. We um, identify sites where it's possible to add new housing. That would be our sites inventory and what we also call sometimes opportunity sites. It includes a review of goals, policies, and programs and figuring out new ones. There's also new considerations for fair housing, um, fair housing laws to address discrimination and segregation in housing. Also, the state requires that housing elements engage community members in discussing housing needs so that the final plan reflects and responds to community concerns and priorities. Next slide. Um, so these next slides are just sort of what is fair housing, um, definitions of fair housing. Um, fair housing is about all of these things, you know, there's individual city, um, city level responses, but it's about preventing discrimination in housing. And it's also about actively creating opportunities, addressing patterns and the history of segregation and about fostering inclusive communities. Fair housing is both is a both and approach where we would remove barriers for people to live where they choose and where we can increase investment in underserved communities. Um, just a note, you know, parallel to this housing element process, the city's housing department is producing an assessment of fair housing and um, that documents the barriers to housing and identifies strategies to help as well. This um, that plan was is also going to closely follow the housing element um, and the timeline for adoption. Next slide. Um, this chart shows um, the different protected classes under fair housing, um, both for the federal and state of California. And our analysis includes analysis of these um, particular groups as well in our draft document. Next slide. So a little bit more about fair housing and, and why we're doing that this time around for the housing element update. Uh, with California Assembly Bill 686 being um, signed by the governor, it requires that all housing elements address fair housing. Um, again, it's about preventing discrimination and um, doing more than just um, ending it. There's also um, jurisdictions have to redress past discrimination. So we have to think about how do we overcome these parent, uh, patterns of segregation? How do we make communities more welcoming and inclusive? And how do we have fairness and opportunity for all, regardless of race, religion, gender, family status, disability, et cetera? Um, and it improve, it includes also you know, improving access to where people currently live. Next slide. Um, these are just some of the examples of fair housing issues that we um, we know about and that we've heard about actually in our work and our analysis. So um, some are about discrimination on the individual level, like large families having a harder time getting accepted for apartments uh, or renters being evicted because um, they don't display a certain type of behavior. It's also um, and some other examples um, also intersect with discrimination in other areas like in income or employment, and together they just create a larger pattern, um, like that more renters tend to be non-white and that people who pay too much for housing are also more likely to be Latino, Latinx, or African American. All of these issues play into larger patterns of segregation where we can see definable patterns of where people live in the city on the basis of race, ethnicity, and protected characteristics. Next slide. Um, so like many other large cities in the, in the US, we have a distinct pattern of segregation by race and socioeconomic status in San Jose. This map is from the HUD uh, Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Tool. The, you can sort of see the outline of the city's limits and um, each dot represents 75 people. Orange dots are non-Hispanic white residents purple dots are Asian and Pacific Islander, blue are Latino um, households, and orange dots with some purple are concentrated in the West and the South, and then the blue and purple you will see is in the East. Um, so you 
through this map, you do see there's a strong division of where people live on the basis of race and ethnicity. Um, and it's just a fact that you know, this is where our city stands right now. Next slide. Oh, next slide. Sorry, I meant to take that one out. Um, okay, so this gets us to our timeline. So where are we in our process? We started in 2019 with the Housing Department's Assessment of Fair Housing. Um, their initial findings were presented to City Council in June of 2021, and they've been updated and incorporated into the housing element document itself. We launched community outreach and engagement for the housing element update about a year ago now, last September, and uh, we had a series of meetings and events over um, these different phases here. Right now, we're in phase four, where we've put the draft out for the public review um, per a 30-day public comment period. That's also another state law that went into effect that required that we post our draft before we send it to HCD for their review. Um, we did integrate changes to the draft based on public comments and letters received. And right now, um, the state uh, housing community development, HCD, they have our draft element and are reviewing it. We expect their comment letter in mid-December. Um, we do expect about three reviews, three um, cycles of, of review with the state. And we hope that the last one will be a little bit more short and just formally before we start taking these to the formal, through the formal public hearing process, which will culminate with the city council review and adoption sometime in late spring. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we have um, the draft housing element document itself posted. Uh, we've done that, it's it's still online right now. You can, um, the next slide and we'll share with you, it does have links to um, where you can get this information. During that 30 day public review, we received 17 comment letters, 17 online form submissions. Um, as I said, we've incorporated some of those um, suggestions and then the ones that we didn't incorporate, we are just um, pending further staff evaluation. The draft, uh, again, we expect the state to give us their comments and their feedback mid-December, and then public feedback is still welcome now through mid-December, and then we'll start another phase once we respond to the state's comments. Next slide. And this just outlines um, the next steps in more of a, a table format. When uh, we're going to planning commission, there's also study sessions for the Housing and Community Development Commission. Um, uh, formal approvals will include the Airport Land Use Commission, Housing and Community Development Planning Commission, and then City Council adoption. Next slide. And that's where you can find some information. The first link is where we have our draft posted. We also have um, we have videos, we have webinars, we have notes from all of our community meetings, presentations, PowerPoints. Uh, and then the, the three bullets there are just more general housing element in the Bay Area, MTCA bags website that provided a lot of technical assistance to cities as we were developing this work. And then finally, HCD's website that talks about um, what's required in these housing elements. And last slide, I think that's it open for questions or comments. Mr. Chair, I'll turn it to you. Uh, we have 15 minutes for, 13 minutes for questions and answers. Great. Uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you, uh, Ruth. Um, Ruth, on our study session coming up for the Planning Commission, is it really more of a, of a public vetting of the housing element in front of the commission? Or is the commission supposed to take an action? Uh, no action. Uh, we are open to your feedback and your thoughts on on the draft and what um, we'll be presenting in terms of the the programs and policies. Great. Commissioners, questions. Commissioner Rosario. Uh, sure. I just emailed Mark about this, but is there a way we can get a copy of these slides? Yes. From, uh, yeah, I think so. Happy to share that. Yeah. Thank you so much. The commission clerk will send it to all commissioners. Any other commissioners? Here we go, Commissioner Barrosio. Perfect, thank you. Hi, Ruth, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for presenting this information to us. Um, 
Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, I appreciate you bringing up fair housing. Um, from the first presentation, um, I hope she's still with us as well. If she wants to chime in, Rachel. But how would you say cluster housing would, um, like that approach to development, be be seen under um, fair housing? And then I have a second follow up. Um, can you define cluster housing? It's it's a term that I just learned today. I don't know if Rachel is still on the call. Um, she gave an example of a tower example. Hey, Ruth, you know how like developments come up and they'll do one building market rate and they'll do another one affordable okay. because of the financing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the example cluster. Um, I would say that maybe some of the things that, because we've had these, we actually have a project like that that was entitled over at Tamian Station. You had like two towers, you know, five, six stories that were market rate. And then on a separate lot, it's an affordable project. It's actually moving forward now. Um, but I think, you know, some considerations for us to, to think about is that, um, how separate they are in terms of the amenities. Um, I understand that there's like financing issues and that's why they tend to be separated, but, um, we, I don't think there's any way for us to deny a project like that, um, only because like, because they're separated, at least from the planning perspective. I know that housing has their considerations when it comes to the IHO and, and inclusionary housing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and this question, um, uh, I'm highlighting from from another commissioner that asked it as well, Miss Miss Ornelas Wise. Um, is there something? I don't know if this is um, like in the sixth cycle where where we can bring up um, uh, the data of affordable housing being spread out throughout a city. Um, is that is that something that could that can happen in the sixth cycle where every district takes its fair share of affordable housing? So um, with AB 686, the state law that requires us to, to conduct fair housing analysis and throughout the entire um, housing element or those fair housing principles, one of the guidelines from HCD is that when we are looking at our, um, you know, the 62,200 units, our site's inventory, that we can't concentrate more than half of them in areas that are already um, high poverty or um, segregated areas. So the intent is that, like you said, kind of everyone takes their fair share, we spread the love, we have sites throughout the city and they're not all, all of the low income ones are not clustered, for example, in one particular district or another. And um, we'll discuss this at the study session, but our analysis, um, the way that we identified sites, that was one of the criteria was that when we're looking at sites that are suitable for low, lower income, which is pretty much, you know, generally close to transit, they support densities over 30 dwelling units to the acre. We have lots of sites throughout our city. They don't have to be in one in one district. And so we did um, the majority of our sites for low income um, developments are in high or highest resource or moderate resource areas. So we did sort of we did that exercise and we think we've met that requirement from HCD. Thank you. Thank you for the clarity. Commissioner Ellis Wise. That was fantastic, Ruth, thank you. Um, I just wanna know, how does the housing element addressing the needs for um, you know, affordable housing for students? There's just been so many students at San Jose State, city colleges um, that have dealt with housing related issues. And obviously these are kids that you know, wanna do something good with their life. And I really wanna make sure that they're housed. So uh, I don't know, our, I don't know if, San Jose State, you know, falls under some other district, or if those needs are included in, in how, how you're looking at that in the housing element. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point and a good question. Um, I don't believe students are considered a, one of those protected classes or special populations. We do have to do analysis, for example, for persons with disabilities, for um, I think large families, and, and other groups, but I don't think students fall under that. Um, I mean, San Jose State, if they want to build housing within their, their property and within their, the boundaries of their school, they typically, I think, go through the state architectural um, office and they don't come to us for permits. They don't have to. But um, I would say, you know, I think most of the sites in our inventory, yeah, the majority of them are within growth areas. So downtown, North San Jose, urban villages, and they can help facilitate um, higher density housing. So that's what we're 
essentially planning for is more of not less single family homes and more apartments and i would assume like those that's what would be affordable for for the students but there uh, we don't have any strategies specifically for students in in the inventory in the in the housing element yeah i mean it would be nice to have some I, i've also um know that city colleges both have had a hard time retaining faculty because of the high cost of housing and unfortunately sometimes these people have to come from far away um so it's not just the downtown San Jose, but I think uh, looking into other city colleges like Evergreen, like maybe areas around San Jose City College and really trying to create more um, higher density there for faculty and for students. Because I know typically, you know, the first year students typically live on campus, but after that, you know, they want to venture off on their own and get apartments or whatnot, but, um, but that would be nice to include. Thank you. John too? I just wanted to answer like, it's really hard for the department overall to, because of fair housing, to say one type of housing over another. But what the city has done is in a couple of years ago, they passed a co-living ordinance, which allowed a certain type of development that's more dormitory and like, um, to give them certain requirements that, you know, typical, or to get them out of certain requirements that other regular typical unit developments have to do. So I would say that's one way the city's approach. Um, you just kind of facilitate that development. And when we look at projects near university and they say, well, does it, the reason it's designed this way is to accommodate this specific demographics, there's been a little bit of leeway in that aspect. Um, so I would say that's one way that we've been able to do within the confines of not treating one housing differently than another. Thanks, John. Anyone else? No questions. I think we would just move to the next agenda item, assuming the presenter is ready. Robert. I'm the next presenter, so. <laughs> oh, hey, John. <laughs> All right, then I think we're good to go. There's no more questions, so. All right. Thanks, Ruth. Can we get to the next slide? So uh, good afternoon or evening. Um, so my name is John Tu, Acting Division Manager. I supervise the Development Review Team. I'm also going to have David Keon to go over some of the CEQA aspects of, of our zoning and land use. So quickly, we're going to go over some development review process and other, and other items, but I wanted to kind of address some of the comments or questions you guys had uh, sent to us about the specific topic. But I'm mainly going to be talking about the application types and how we process them and their you know, approval bodies. A very high level explanation of private development from site research, acquisition, entitlement, construction to leasing. And uh, finally, what is the role of the planning commissioners? Planning commission, uh, next slide. What this slide is attempting to do is summarize over a hundred pages of the zoning ordinance into a flow chart. Um, the left side boxes are the different application types. The middle sections are the initial hearing bodies and the far right are the appeal bodies. In general, from top to bottom, you're going from projects that have less discretion to projects with more discretion. Um, the project with more discretion usually is a higher level hearing body. The problems with less discretions are usually over the counter permits or ministerial. Um, <clears throat> the top boxes are application we, that we call administrative and ministerial. Some of the things you've heard earlier about SB 35, AB 2120. These are ones that are that this table doesn't reflect yet, um, but in general, the the SB 35 and 2162 are affordable projects that in the past would have gone to the planning commission or city council or to a public hearing, but because of state laws, they're able to go through a ministerial process. So um, I know that sometimes you don't get the full idea of what the city's doing all for affordable housing, but be aware there is a long list of projects that don't even make it to public hearing that the city planning department is processing and reviewing. Um, in general, it's very similar to the projects you guys see overall. We look for the same level of details, the same kind of elevations, design requirements. They just confine to a different set of rules um, based on meeting certain requirements uh, by the state, uh, concessions and other aspects. Um, in general, uh, staff, uh, the director of planning delegates their authority to staff or themselves to approve or deny these types of projects. These decisions are usually not appealable, but in certain limited cases, such as administrative permits, if staff denies an administrative permit, they can appeal to the director's hearing. The next level of permits requiring a director hearing, which occurs every Wednesday morning. Typically, these permits are more straightforward land uses for new construction or in the cases of PD zoning to effectuate with the PD permit. 
Um, then you go to the Planning Commission. The, the only permit that's specifically really designated to the Planning Commission are conditional use permits. Um, usually these are uses that require additional discretion, such as off-sale, late-night uses, utility facilities. However, the Commission is more likely to see projects taken to them for a recommendation to City Council. Um, the, finally, there's very limited land uses that go straight to City Council. Um, the Planning Commission obviously sees more than conditional use permit. This is because of the concurrent review. When applications submit multiple applications, ordinance allows them to have combine all the ordinance, all the applications together to go. And what happens is whatever is the highest level of review in the process it has to go to, every other permit goes along with it. And this is why you guys see things such as site development, tentative maps, site development permits, um, instead of those going to the other hearing body. Additionally, any project that includes an environmental impact report that includes a new significant impact requires a planning commission hearing for a recommendation to the city council. Um, and so that's kind of why you have one designated specific permit to you, but you guys have a, see a lot of different land use permits that come through you. Uh, it's because of that process. Um, let's see, uh, next slide. So this is the part that's going to be not my area of expertise, but I think there was a lot of questions about, you know, what is the process for a project from beginning to end? So I'm going to attempt to give an overview of it. Um, our Office of Economic Development has a website that goes into detail that's very specific to the city of San Jose, um, as well as there's other city council study sessions that talk about the current state uh, of private development. So um, keep in mind an oversimplification of the process. Each applicant, each site, each developer may have a slightly different model or financing process. So what we've learned is that an applicant will often break down the cost of development into four areas. The acquisition, which is the acquiring of the land or the buildings. The hard costs. So these are the things people usually think of, materials, labor, the actual construction of the building. The soft costs, uh, which is legal, professional fees, insurance, development fees. This is actually the process. We are part of the soft costs when we review the projects and our application fees and other aspects. And the cost of conversion, a um, little hard to explain, but it's kind of like the changing the titles of the hands, the reserves for the building and future construction and other aspects. Um, so essentially kind of facilitating the project along. Um, when you take all these into account, um, when the, the applicants and the developers, they look at all these costs and they're not always stagnant. So if the cost of construction goes up really high or our soft costs goes up, certain aspects means that they can only pay so much for our land. So it, all these play into a different factor of how much they can afford for each, uh, each aspect. Often they'll eventually start off with a project thinking they finance in one way and as the market changes later, they totally think the project does not pencil out. So often in some cases, as some of the commissioners pointed out before, we've entitled projects and they just haven't gotten constructed or they've been modified at future stages. Um, so the, all these play a role in eventually getting something constructed. Um, so what after they get entitled for, uh, from us, the project um, goes through the entire process, they finish their financing process and figures how they're going to pay for the project, then they move on to getting their actual permits for construction. So this includes uh, predominantly building department, public works departments, this is when they had to pay their impact fees, this is when they have to get, you know, things that are more important towards the construction when construction drawings are drawn, such as getting their determination no hazard from the FAA um, and all those other things. Then you construct the building. Sometimes they have an occupant in mind. Sometimes they do not. So now you have to decide how you're going to occupy the building and complete the deal that way. So this is my best oversimplification of the process. I'm happy to try to take questions later about that. But in general, our role is more on the soft costs and the other aspects is controlled by the developers, the markets, and other aspects. Next. So uh, the, one of the questions that was asked was like, what is the role of the Planning Commission? The role of the Commission is, is, is spelled out in the city's charter. The Planning Commission is largely the advisory body to the City Council on land uses and the appealing body for the director's hearing permits and initial decision makers for conditional use permits. Staff conducts the day-to-day -day work for intake, review, outreach, coordinate various departments to ultimately shape the project to be consistent with our various different policies, ordinances, city, state laws, and general plan. In the end, we hope to bring forward to you a staff report that summarizes the process, 
lays out a recommendation on how the project is consistent to those requirements if we're recommending approval. You as a public hearing body can agree or disagree with our analysis based on your professional experience or based on public comments. However, when making your decision to approve or deny a project or make a recommendation, there should be some kind of justification of the decision which, the confine, which is confined to as whether or not it meets the findings of consistencies or inconsistencies to those policies. Uh, this ensures a fair and transparent process for project review and ensures that our decisions are legally defensible in the future. So I'm going to hand it over to David to go over the sequel component. Well, good afternoon, um, planning commissioners. Um, so David Keon, principal planner on the city's environmental review team. So they saw some questions. Can everybody hear me? Really good? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So just there are some questions came up about CEQA. Um, one of the one of the questions was about what are the typical common environmental impacts of development in San Jose? And so just wanted to provide a quick overview. And since this is something you see day in, day out in EIRs and in initial studies that come before your commission, um, the typical, most of our projects in San Jose are urban infill projects. Um, this is probably at least 80% plus of the projects that we deal with because most development is within the urbanized area, already disturbed land in areas like downtown and priority growth areas like urban villages and industrial areas. You know, it's very, very middle greenfield development, meaning development in areas that have not been disturbed yet. So, you know, the most of our environmental impacts in San Jose fall into the category of construction impacts. Um, this includes impacts to nesting migratory birds. Um, this also includes construction air quality. And this is mainly due to dust, health risk impacts from the operation of construction equipment, such as those using diesel fuel. Um, also, common impacts are related to archaeology and tribal cultural resources. This is due to the fact that a lot of the city is archaeologically sensitive. Um, also, construction noise, you know, due to the operation of equipment and also vibration from the operation of the equipment. Um, particularly on adjacent structures, including historic structures. Um, also, um, soil and groundwater contamination is often an impact from development, especially those involving excavation. Um, this is very common um, because most of the valley was a prior agricultural use, so you have potential residual contamination on the site that would need to be addressed in future development. And so, you know, all of these you see fairly standard mitigation measures in order to reduce and lessen significant. Um, and these are fairly common for projects throughout the city. In addition, um, other infill projects due to the design characteristics or location sometimes have unique impacts. Um, the most common one that you are going have seen and are going to be seen in the next few months are, in, are projects that are impacting historic resources, either this be impacts to the city landmark district or demolition of a, of a city landmark. You know, those are unique impacts and those are required to do additional mitigation or even in many cases that you're seeing recently where they cannot reduce that impact unless it's significant. Therefore, they are had, there is the requirement that an EIR be prepared with a statement of overriding consideration. Um, another common impact, especially in areas further out from the downtown area is that the project may identify a vehicle miles traveled impact because the vehicle miles traveled um, from the project will be exceed the thresholds in our city council policy 5-1. And even with mitigation, in some cases, they cannot be reduced unless it's significant, um, which should also require an EIR. And actually, Ramses is about to talk about that shortly about our updates to that policy. Um, also, there is even in infill projects, there are sensitive habitats that could be impacted, particularly riparian quarters. Um, a recent example was last year, there was the impact to the riparian corridor along the Guadalupe River in downtown um, from a major high-rise office project. There's also a more recent example than that is the Alviso Hotel project that was adjacent to the Guadalupe River and near wetlands. In addition, there's potential impacts of serpentine soil and burrow and owl habitat. Um, this these are less common, but they do occur, especially in areas that are adjacent to sensitive habitat. Um, non-urban infill projects, which we don't have a huge amount of, but 
they, they do exist, especially you know, smaller projects outside the urban services line, but they do have impacts that could be more, more significant, especially with regards to sensitive habitat. Um, you know, just you know, examples of projects that are proposed in Coyote Valley may impact things like wildlife corridors and sensitive habitat there or any projects in the foothills. Um, also, because these projects outside the urban services line are further away from transit and further away from the concentration of development, they may have higher vehicle miles traveled, meaning they would have this vehicle miles traveled impact. And also many projects you know, that further out could have greenhouse gas emission impacts or geologic hazards impacts, among others. There's, you know, depending on the type of project, you know, there may be even more more types of project, more types of impacts. But overall, in, in San Jose, I would say 80 to 90 percent of the types of impacts that we identify in our documents are those related to construction impacts um, from urban and built projects, as this is a built out city. Uh, next slide, please. So another question is what what to look at, what key documents to focus on. I know as a planning commission, um, you receive links to the CEQA documents or you see the packet and it's huge. I mean, just the EIRs in some cases are 1500 pages plus attachments is a bit bewildering. Um, what really as the commission, as you're making recommendations on the adequacy of the environmental document and the project, the first place to start recommend is that for environmental impact reports is the summary, which is in the very beginning of the EIR. Um, this includes impacts, mitigation, alternatives, in addition to reviewing the project description. Say the project description for CEQA can be a good place to start to also understand the entirety of the project because the entirety of the project has to be described in order to adequately analyze. So it's a good place to start even generally um, just to get an idea of what's coming. Um, also, just want to mention so this planning commission is included when these documents are posted to the internet we send a link to the planning commission so this could be six months or more before the item actually comes before the commission however the commission is notified so if you're interested you see an eir notification or ismd notification for that matter come out um, you could take a look at it so this is you know to get an idea of the project that is likely to be coming before you at a future date. Um, I also recommend looking at what for EIRs is called the First Amendment and for ISMDs is called the Response to Comments. Um, this is a good place to look. You know, the, so the First Amendment is how the city, when we see public comments during public circulation, the city responds to those comments and includes any text edits in response to those comments. Um, so the First Amendment for an EIR is a good place to look to kind of see what the controversies are and the city's response to those concerns. You know, it, you know, it will be something that, you know, if it's going to be coming before the Planning Commission, it would be a good idea to take a look at that to have an idea of potential issues that will be raised. Um, in addition, for especially for EIRs, this is important, the draft resolution and the mitigation monitoring reporting program known as the MMRP. Um, those are included in the Planning Commission packet that is sent prior to the hearing. This is a good place to look to get a, a, basically an overview of the entirety of the EIR in one document, you know, because it includes impacts, mitigation measures, and findings. And in particular, as John was alluding to earlier, the Planning Commission is has to make a recommendation on projects that have a significant unavoidable impact. It has to make a recommendation to the city council. Um, if there's a significant unavoidable impact, a statement of overriding considerations must be made pursuant to CEQA. That statement of overriding considerations includes, includes factors that are taken into consideration as to why, despite the fact that significant unavoidable impacts have been identified, there's other benefits of the project. This is a good place you know, to a good place to review prior to the meeting because this is part of the key function of the Planning Commission to make a recommendation to City Council. It is typically towards the end of the resolution. So when you look, you go through the resolution, you go towards the end, it'll be one of the last sections. 
um, initial studies for mitigating negative declarations, negative declarations and addendums, such as addendums to downtown strategy. Um, those are similar to EIRs, but they're more, there's, you know, there's, there's less sections in terms of, uh, we don't, for example, there's no alternatives in initial studies for MNDs and NDs. However, there's still information that's available. Um, for the commission report to place to review would be the project description. And also the, that for the MND or ND, there's the signed cover page that would include, if it's an MND, mitigated negative, negative declaration would include impacts and mitigation measures. So it's a good idea to get an overview of what the impacts and mitigation measures are. In addition, if there's been public comments on the initial study that would also be posted to the website, and this includes the responses, so it would be a good way to have a review of what the controversies are and how the city's respond to it. In addition, I also mentioned, you know, if there's mitigation measures, there's also there's still the requirement for an MMRP. And this is a good place to also review the summarize the impacts and mitigation measures, which should be included in the PC packet. So that's that concludes my presentation and I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Commissioners, eight. okay, Commissioner Ornelas Wise. We only have two minutes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, David. I'll be quick. Um, just because we're seeing so many high rises, um, of course, in the downtown area, you know, noise pollution with the planes being so close um, and working with the, the Airport Land Use Commission would be great to get advice on that. But the traffic impacts and pedestrian safety is really critical um, just because I've seen so many pedestrians fatalities. Um, so I, I would just like to see you beef up mitigation measures for pedestrian safety and traffic, um, like improvements outside of, of the project, given the, the density. That's uh, all I have to say. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Young. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, David, my question has to do with um, large warehouse projects, fulfillment centers, um, of which looking at the IRs, we have several of those coming before us. Um, and my concern on these is the impact of diesel truck exhausts that are idling at the facility during operations. I actually contacted a couple of planners on this. Um, and I, I think it's interesting that we have requirements during construction of how long the construction equipment can idle, but we don't have anything for the actual operations and you know diesel exhaust is very toxic and can definitely impact the folks that work at these facilities as well as neighbors so my question is 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 it possible for staff to reach out to other agent other agencies that are getting these fulfillment centers um, i know southern california is getting a lot of them and see if anyone has addressed this issue as a condition of approval to try and limit the amount of idling that can take place. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, one, one thing that we have been working at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District on is how to address things like distribution centers and impacts of that. Um, I know there's been, we've been working with BACMED <laughs> as the Bay Area Air Quality Management District on conditions and mitigation for, for for truck. I mean, truck tr diesel particulate matter is one of the key concerns, especially regarding to idling and also routes to and from the distribution center if they go through areas where there's residential concentrations. So that is something that is evaluated. Um, and there are also re requirements of what to do if the Trucks will have, have refrigerated units. So for some distribution centers, there's refrigerated units and some are no refrigeration. So there's different requirements for that that we're working with FACMED on. And it is something that also has to be taken into account with the air quality analysis. Uh, and this is particularly important if the distribution center is within a thousand feet of sensitive receptors. And this would be residential areas, schools, daycare centers, um, convalescent hospitals, those kind of reviews, if it's in a thousand feet, then definitely there'd be analysis and potential mitigation measures of operation in addition to construction. Um, where it does fall, you know, it's not 
often mitigation measures is if the distribution center is located in an industrial area where it's further away and there's no residential areas or sensitive receptors, then that may not have any of the mitigation measures. So Thanks. Commissioner Young, I just wanted to add that in addition to DMV licensing, the California Air Resources Board also regulates these and the facilities have to go to them for permits as well, just so you know. Great. Great. So moving on to item eight, BMT policy, Ramses and Jessica. Hey everybody, yeah, Ramses Madhu. Actually, I just had a, I had a question before we move on. I, I think we're past due the time. I mean, Robert, do you wanna, is it okay or? Uh, we can move ahead and then we do have 30 minutes extra so we can get back to you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey everybody, uh, Ramses Madhu, uh, Division Manager of Planning, Policy and Sustainability uh, for the Department of Transportation. Um, Jessica Zank is not joining us today. I am filling in for our, both of us. I'm gonna be talking about the current vehicle miles travel policy. Let's share my screen here. Oh, um, let's see. Oh, uh, David, can you stop sharing your screen? So uh, Jennifer, can you please? Uh, I think it's Jennifer, yeah. Or Jennifer, sorry, yeah. Yep. There we go. All right, and let me get this right. Um, where is it? And all right, just making sure you guys are seeing it in presenter view or the correct view. Yes. Yes, good, good. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we're gonna be talking about the vehicle miles travel policy. Um, now, I'm not talking about the totality of the uh, uh, Council Policy 5-1, which is our transportation analysis policy. I'm just going to touch on that lightly at the higher level for a second, and then we're going to dive into the current vehicle miles travel piece, which is a portion of the C4 rules uh, following on David's uh, presentation. So overall, how uh, uh, the city deals with uh, traffic or transportation impacts uh, from uh, new projects is dealt as processed through Council Policy 5-1. Council, so Council Policy 5-1 has two uh, portions to it. One is the local transportation analysis piece. Now, uh, I just heard a comment there about downtown high rises and transportation safety issues, uh, which is kind of the core of what DOT really is thinking about now. How do we make those things better? Now, a lot of that, those things are not CEQA mitigations. They are, in fact, uh, general uh, plan policy uh, based uh, improvement requests that come through the local transportation analysis uh, for projects. Now, some of these safety projects and other things can come through CEQA. Um, not to say they can't, but most of them come through the other side of this policy where we're looking at how does a, a project uh, affect its immediate environs and what kinds of demands will it put on that? Right? What kinds of needs is it uh, needing for pedestrian crossings and bicycle needs and stuff like that. But today we're really going to focus on the vehicle miles traveled portion of the policy. And let's see if I can get these slides to move ahead. There we go. Oh, they're animated. I didn't realize that. All right, so we're talking about for a second why VMT and what is VMT. VMT is vehicle miles traveled, of course, and then talk a little bit about implementation. All right, so where does vehicle miles traveled at VMT come from? Um, well, uh, some time ago, uh, the state Senate uh, passed SB 743. Um, SB 743 um, uh, extolled the whole state uh, to promote infill development, particularly near transit, wanted to focus transportation impacts uh, coming out of uh, uh, a CEQA process on a more regional perspective, understanding that transportation demand and transportation in general um, is not a localized piece, right? You know, very few people just stay in their neighborhood. Um, also, it required the removal of level of service from uh, CEQA review. We're gonna talk about what level of service is versus vehicle miles traveled in a second here. Um, uh, so we are no longer allowed to measure that under a CEQA review. Um, and then it recommended vehicle miles traveled in transportation analysis under CEQA. Now, since then, uh, the uh, uh, OPR, the Office of Planning and Research, which uh, is the body in the state that uh, interprets and gives guidelines to cities out of rules like this, um, has uh, put out uh, much guidance um, that uh, pushes forward how this bill will be interpreted um, and basically uh, uh, cemented vehicle miles traveled as the way uh, to, to move forward out of this bill. 
Now, for the city of San Jose, this actually really uh, jived with our own policies, right? So our own general plan uh, uh, really saw this vehicle miles traveled change as supporting a great deal of, of what we were trying to do anyways. Um, and as such, we actually became the fourth city in the state um, to adopt the vehicle miles traveled uh, metric for our CEQA review um, uh, well before most other cities in the state. Um, and here are some of the, the elements of the general plan's goals um, that we see this, um, this policy supporting. Not only that, uh, but as you all know, we have a climate smart plan um, and vehicle miles traveled reduction um, is a significant portion of um, uh, the needs or the, uh, the strategies we see as trying to meet um, our climate uh, um, uh, impact goals. Um, so, you know, getting people out of cars and into other modes is one huge one, um, but then um, uh, um, uh, reducing the actual use of private vehicles is another one. All right, so let's start off with what was there before. Um, so a lot of times you'll hear this, uh, you know, we, we measured things through LOS, and those of you who have been around for a long time, you know what this is. Um, uh, level of service measures how much congestion there is for cars at signalized intersections. Basically, how long are you going to wait at an intersection to get through? Um, and there's a rating of A through F on this, um, and um, it focuses merely on how long vehicles will wait at an intersection. And this was the primary metric uh, for the transportation system for a very long time until this VMT change came in. So then vehicle miles traveled. What vehicle miles traveled does is measure how, uh, uh, how far people will typically travel by vehicle related to uh, a, a, a project. And I should also put there and how often, right? Because it's both how many trips will be taken and then how, uh, how uh, average, uh, how long are those trips, right? So places that have low VMT or projects that have low VMT are, place, are areas uh, where people can walk to more of their services or even drive to their services, but they're close by. Um, uh, so basically uh, when you can get around quickly, um, no matter what mode your VMT is getting lowered, then the more we can make those trips outside the vehicles, the, the easier it is for that. Um, high VMT project, uh, projects and areas uh, are just places where people have to, to travel further um, to get what they need, out of, um, whether it be getting to their jobs, getting shopping done, visiting other people and that. And they usually don't have a lot of other options. All right, so just a quick kind of image. What, what does this kind of look like in the real world, right? Um, uh, certain places downtown can get an LOS of F um, and really see the VMT value as A. And you can see here, we have this very old picture here uh, looking down Santa Clara Street, um, near actually the same intersection that you probably recognize from the first picture um, where you have basically the reverse of these um, uh, uh, kinds of um, uh, measurements. Now, this is a little tongue in cheek just to kind of paint the picture, um, but it's fun of this measurement change fundamentally alters the way that we see transportation from a CEQA perspective. The primary point now is to create uh, or to reduce emissions, one. Two, to create vibrant uh, uh, environments uh, where people uh, are uh, uh, more comfortable um, outside of their cars uh, to walk, ride their bike, and things like that. Now, what does this look like across the city? Now, there are two basic measurements um, of vehicle miles traveled. One is per job, and one is per resident or per capita. Um, the uh, projects, uh, commercial projects, office projects, things like that, um, come in through, of course, VMT per job. And you can see here um, how this plays out across the city. Now, um, the, this map is colored to the, the, to the way that the policy is enacted. So green means it, the, those are threshold areas, meaning the places within there are can generally be assumed, uh, or projects within those areas, as long as they meet some other criteria, can generally be assumed not to have a vehicle miles traveled impact. Um, uh, yellow is right at the regional average. And the way that this rule is set up is generally projects need to uh, uh, address their VMT impacts by reducing to 15% below the regional average, right? And so this is the state's attempt to slowly move the ball 
uh, uh, in, in the, the correct direction of producing this. Orange is uh, we have uh, research uh, uh, based uh, uh, um, um, I wouldn't say certainty, but 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 clear, uh, um, uh, support to say that we can mitigate BMT in those orange areas. And red are places where, um, uh, unless you do something very drastic, um, it's going to be very hard for projects to mitigate for BMT. Um, what's interesting in these maps for those of you who uh, who have been in this uh, world for a long time is you can really see the jobs housing imbalance in this map. Right, North San Jose, where you have a lot of jobs and not very much housing. The uh, jobs map here um, shows an uh, mitigable area for, um, uh, uh, for commercial sites. Now, if we move over to the housing side, you can see how this flips. Now, housing um, in, in San Jose um, uh, actually has quite a bit more area that uh, meets the threshold. And again, you can see in North San Jose how much that flips because there are so many jobs up there. Um, putting housing up there is, is a very positive thing, right? So I'll let you just soak this in just for a second and I'm gonna keep moving on. All right, now there are three pathways through this uh, policy. Now, again, putting our, our mind in the right context, this rule is a portion of our CEQA um, um, uh, process, right? Only one. There's still historic uh, needs. There's still um, uh, 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 all of the other portions of uh, uh, CEQA that, that David was just talking about. So just in this one segment of CEQA, there are three different ways to get through this. One are projects uh, uh, not required to evaluate PMT. Basically, these are projects with some minimal um, uh, review um, can be said to um, uh, to be assumed not to have a vehicle miles traveled impact. Sometimes this is called screening. That's the word the state uses around this. Um, and I'm going to add just a little more context, hopefully not making it too complicated here, is that these are our current requirements. Um, and as many of you probably know, um, we, there are uh, some changes to this policy being uh, discussed, um, uh, I believe, at your next uh, uh, um, uh, general meeting. Um, we're hoping this gives you some good context to understand that conversation. Right? So these are the, um, again, the ways that kinds of projects that uh, don't have to evaluate BMT. The easy one to understand, of course, is small infill projects, um, also local serving retail, right? Uh, generally, if you put a new uh, Safeway or 7-Eleven or anything like that within a neighborhood that usually draws people closer um, um, uh, or uh, yeah, into closer retail away from the farther away retail that they used to have to go to. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep moving. Um, but basically, we have those kind of definitional projects there. And then you have uh, projects within special areas, particularly planned growth areas uh, that are near high quality transit in the current rules. The second um, the second way through this uh, uh, um, policy are those um, that do need to evaluate their VMT and can mitigate, right? And so um, projects to, to understand this and to, to kind of understand evaluation of VMT, there's basically thresholds of significance, right? A project gets um, uh, uh, from those maps I showed you, it gets a number from there, how much vehicle miles travel is associated with its site. Um, and there's a, a calculator we have. Um, uh, that I'll show you in a second that projects can use to then understand uh, not only their area vehicle miles traveled, but then how their project affects vehicle miles traveled, and then understand what they might need to do to mitigate it. So again, if you look back at those maps, which I'll show you in a second, again, anything that's not in those kind of uh, salmon colored areas um, can uh, mitigate for our understanding, um, and they can uh, drive that down. Now for residential and employment uses, uh, the direction from the state and, and uh, the, the, the basic threshold that we adopted is to get 15% below baseline or the regional average um, for that land use. For industrial sites, uh, we understood that to be uh, not uh, viable. Um, and so we did uh, say instead of below to just meet the baseline per capita. Then there's this last group of projects, projects that can't fully get, mitigate their VMT, right? 
So these are projects that need that statement of overriding consideration, right? Um, that that uh, David was just talking about. Now, right now, um, uh, projects that want to get a statement of overriding considerations, um, uh, these are the conditions under which they might uh, they, uh, the city council would consider such a move, and these are written in the general plan, right? Um, uh, so they can't be general plan amendments. Um, all projects uh, must reduce and mitigate VMT to their full extent, and this is very important. Right? So the projects, even if they're getting that overriding consideration, they still have to do as much as they possibly can to address their environmental impact. Um, and uh, after that, um, there are uh, overriding benefits, um, including a, 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 a cost um, uh, calculated based on how much vehicle miles traveled that we're not able to, to mitigate. Um, and uh, there is 100% uh, affordable housing um, gets uh, um, a, a much easier way through this process as well. Um, now, um, I have slides that go through uh, buckets, more deep in the buckets, but I was going to wait and see if you guys have questions on that. The way that our BNT mitigations are structured are into four different buckets. So the, what we did as we built out the policy 5-1 um, is do a deep research uh, uh, project to really figure out what are the types of mitigations um, that have uh, justifiable research behind it um, so that we know that when we are um, saying that these mitigations have effect um, that that's coming from um, either academic or otherwise notable research and all of that research is noted in our in our uh, in our communications um, that I'll show you here in a second. So there's four buckets. One are project-based elements, and that's actually density, location, some of these uh, elements that are actually part of a, a, a land use definition. The second one is infrastructure, right? And so this is the immediate area. Um, you can mitigate your VMT um, by things like adding, um, adding bike lanes um, uh, and, and increasing uh, walkability within your neighborhood, things like that. Um, of course, there's parking. Um, uh, parking is, is shown to be one of the most uh, impactful and meaningful um, uh, actions that projects can take to reduce their uh, vehicle miles traveled, basically not creating uh, an easy way for cars to get in and, and stay there for free um, uh, is, has been shown over and over again um, to be one of the ways that vehicle miles traveled can be reduced. Um, and then, of course, TDM or transportation demand management. These are programmatic approaches um, that, that fund uh, folks' ability to, uh, to not use a private automobile. So this is things like transit passes, um, uh, showers in the building for people who take their bikes, um, um, ensuring that there is adequate um, uh, uh, facilities for people using their bikes, like uh, uh, fix-it stations or, or well-appointed um, well bike um, uh, lockers and things like that. Um, now, how is this uh, implemented? Um, when we built, uh, when we uh, put together the policy, we also put together an implementation tool um, that um, is now becoming the standard um, across the, um, the city and actually being uh, copied by quite a lot of other areas in the state. I'm sorry, it's being, uh, becoming the standard across the county. Um, what we did is, is we created a calculator that holds basically those maps we showed you. Um, every single parcel has its own vehicle miles traveled number. Um, and then um, uh, projects can come in. You can see here land use type on the left. Um, they can put in there uh, what kind of project they're, they're going to be building based on these uh, factors of dwelling units and uh, how, how much affordable office space uh, or retail uh, square footage, things like that. And what that does is it then gives uh, project um, uh, uh, champions, um, developers, um, quick readouts saying here, you know, for residential projects or employment projects, um, uh, these are the numbers. Existing VMT, meaning if you're looking at the charts here on the right, you have the orange element. Um, this orange element shows um, how much the existing VMT is. Um, in the, the project site here. And here you can see it was a Capital Avenue mixed use development that was being uh, 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 tested. Um, and tier one, two, and three, these are the different tiers or those different buckets I was showing you uh, of mitigations, right? So tier one is project characteristics. So you can kind of see here are those density 
um, uh, increased employment uh, or residential density, employment density, things like that. Um, tier two is that multimodal infrastructure we were just talking about. Tier three is parking. And again, tier four is that TDM programming. Excuse me. Um, right, and so this tool is actually what we use within the city to help us understand uh, the, the uh, mitigations and, and the project characteristics within this process. Um, let's see what else do I want to say here. What's really nice about this is it gives uh, developers an immediate upfront view of how their project stands within this uh, um, uh, within this uh, CEQA uh, category, as well as the types of things the city wants them to do. And in fact, the, the readout from this is, is required in, in, their, in their transportation submission. Um, of course, there's a lot more to this, but I'm going to let you guys leave me with questions um, and uh, I will um, move out of the way and take anything you guys uh, have for me. Okay, I know we have commissioner questions, but I think this is also a time for public comment. I know people have been waiting for a long time. So can we maybe see if there's anyone who wants to address the commission on this study session from the public? Chair, yeah, I just want to say I have to pick up my daughter from school, so I have to leave. So yeah, I got a bail right now too. So that's why I wanted to get the public comment in. Okay. So can we just uh, promote it, Alex Shore for a brief public comment? Sure. Uh, can, you on, on, uh, can you stop sharing the screen, please? Ah, uh, yes. You all want me to go now, or yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Well, good, good job, all you sticking through a few hours of this. Uh, a lot of good ground covered. Just wanted to highlight something. Catalyze SV members are, are really excited about. Um, by the way, this is Alex Shore with Catalyze SV. Came to the Rules Committee this week and is coming to Council soon, which is, and it dovetails with a lot of what the conversations you face on the Planning Commission and that our members care about, which is there's going to be an effort to prioritize projects that receive city funding, prioritize those projects that hold the line and or maximize uh, heights on development projects, something that Pierre Luigi Oliverio has also talked about during these meetings. So really, really excited about this uh, policy memo that is gonna come to the council on November 15th. Think it's gonna have a huge impact in encouraging folks like Rachel Vanderveen, Michael Brio, et cetera, that when they're talking with developers, reviewing projects, that they're saying, hey, uh, why did you reduce the height on this project? We're only going to focus on funding those projects that maximize the number of homes. And that's according, of course, to zoning, construction types, et cetera. So nothing out of bounds. But if, in short, a site allows eight stories and the developer can build eight stories, then those are the affordable housing projects that will be prioritized for funding. So uh, hopefully it'll take some of the guesswork some of the um, challenges in facing community opposition to development and, and put that back on an emphasis around building as much affordable housing as quickly as we can, which is, I know, a priority that many of you as commissioners share. So great progress. I just wanted to share that with you in case you want to track it in the days ahead and in case it interfaces with the work you're doing and the projects you're voting on on the Planning Commission. Thanks for all your time and, and great job staff with a well-rounded presentation from a lot of great city staff today. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I, I think Commissioner Ornelas Wise is left. I apologize, not getting to her question, but uh, Commissioner Young. Yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Ramsey, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really, really interesting and I learned a lot. Um, the question I had is you had two colored maps uh, and I didn't quite understand the difference between the first one and the second one. If you could just talk about that briefly. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So one is, um, let's see here. Can I pull it up again? Where did all my windows go? Um, geez, okay. Um, I think I closed my presentation. I apologize. I'll just tell you. So one is for employment, right? And so basically, 
the way that this rule works is you look at the type of land use it is and the, the, the threshold a project needs to meet it needs to be 15% below the, the regional average of that same land use type. And it's broken down into two types of land use. And we broke it in one, into one, uh, one more industrial and we changed the rules a little bit for that to make it easier. So one was employment. That was that first map I showed you. And the second one was residential. That's the really easy. So to some degree, that, yeah, that, that's what it is. That's the difference. Great, thank you. Is there a Commissioner Cantrell? Did you have your hand up? Yes, but more of a general question, not specifically this area. Are we waiting or are we asking questions from earlier? I think at this point you can go ahead with any residual questions. So mine was around the, the CEQA and, uh, and specifically I'm curious about impact to sensitive environmental areas, places that might be watersheds that, for example, you know, the, the a, um, giant um, uh, warehouse might cause problems with groundwater or things like that, or impact wildlife corridors. Um, you know, I know that in the past there's been some consideration about that, but not about the groundwater, I don't think. So I'm just curious uh, where, you, where you land on that. Yeah, um, thank you. So we do evaluate changes to hydro hydrology. Um, in the reports, however, the, a lot of the impacts on groundwater, you know, it gets more into a situation where you're going to be doing wells, digging wells, and how that could affect groundwater. But you know, we typically, I mean, it's a part of there's hydrology se section that would be evaluated, but we don't typically find major groundwater impacts unless you're talking about groundwater contamination um, yeah, from the project. Okay, yeah, and in that case, yeah, there are very specific state laws, and now we have low impact design requirements, stormwater um, um, requirements that are very stringent and getting stricter every year. The state passes more strict laws and the requirements for filtration for stormwater or to make sure those, no, those contaminants don't not seep into groundwater. Um, because of these laws, we often find situations where old parking lots that ever built in this like 60s or 70s, you know, the, the new development comes in, the new development now has to meet the new standards, the more stringent standards. And in addition, I think next year, the, the size of projects that have to comply with these more stringent stormwater requirements is gonna shrink. So even more projects will have to comply with these when they redevelop. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Any other, uh, Commissioner Barosio? Yes, perfect, thank you. Um, I just have um, a general question um, and anyone on on staff can, can help me process this. So today we heard a lot about um, units, right? Uh, a lot of clarity, um, especially around, around the RENA goals um, and the last presentation, um, especially about um, uh, like the land use, right? Jobs and, um, uh, uh, around jobs and housing. Um, but my question is, I know I know the general plan has has a push towards us not being a bedroom city, right? You know, like bring in more revenue so we can serve um, provide services for the people, right? So how does how does the arena goals that push us to meet certain housing unit um, uh, like benchmarks, how does that square with the general plan? that tells us, hey, we need more commercial, right? We need to bring in more revenue in order to provide the best possible environment and services to our residents. We don't have anybody from Citywide here. Oh, Ruth, there you go. Um, so for one, you know, with, with this, with our RENA numbers and our RENA goals this six cycle, um, we we think it's gonna fall within the the limits, I guess, of the general plan 2040 growth. Um, so it shouldn't go beyond what we've already planned for 2040. But um, I think, you know, it's it's like a balancing act. We we want to also support the commercial uses or mixed uses, but um, I don't think it necessarily cancels the other out. 
However, in reality, a lot of our a lot of our affordable housing projects. Um, now it's a lot more easier, but in the past, you know, they had to use density bonus waivers or concessions or special sort of ways to not provide for that commercial on the ground floor because for them, it has um, proved to be more costly. And then, you know, you know, they can put units down there and they could put services on the ground floor versus a commercial. So um, I think it's it's kind of a balancing. I, I also don't think that they they conflict essentially. And I also like to add that from a comprehensive planning standpoint, the move towards transit-oriented development, infield development, and more mixed uses is actually an effort to solve that problem. I think one of the intention of the law, yes, everyone concentrates on just looking at the number, but it was overall an intensification of the city, both residential and commercial. As we build higher density, it's easier to provide those services to these uh, specific facilities instead of the urban sprawl. Um, so I think I would concentrate that, you know, our plan overall in the general plan accommodates both residential and commercial. And they pointed out that number kind of as a starting point for those policies. And what you've seen is that number's kind of shifted and we may be okay with it because at higher density, we're able to support those residentials at that ratio. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Robert, anything you'd like to close us out with? Well, if there are no more questions, I think, Mr. Chair, you can uh, adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned at 9, 419.